Okay, so in front of me is my uh, Impala, Big Game Bikes uh, electric bike. She is a stunning bike, stunning cycle. I enjoy riding it when I get the chance. Andrew. But the saddle bags are on here. I'm just going to put all my oil kit in there, maybe the camera and one or two other things so I don't have it all about my body. There is my uh, sketching kit that I showed you in last week's video. And uh, yeah, we're going to get ready and we're going to disappear and hopefully... What you can see above there is not going to manifest into a lot of rain, although it is forecast. We shall see how it goes and I'll keep you up to date as we go forward. Hi everybody and welcome back and I'm out in the evening now I went out earlier on the cycle to get a few photographs and maybe do a bit of sketching on the marsh and it went bad quite quickly because the clouds come over I just cycled home in time to get um, dry or stay dry it's just started raining as I pulled up uh, to put the bike inside the garage now, I came out after my dinner and I've had a look around. The sun is really not in evidence. I'm praying that we're going to get a little bit of light at the end of the day here and just do a quick little sketch or two on some uh, Saunders Waterford 140 pound hot press paper. Now, what you see in front of you is a very quick uh, setup. Now, this is that plein air kit that I showed you uh, in the last video. What I've done and I wasn't sure when I talked to you about it what I was actually going to do with that. But what I've done is I put a quick release plate with a quarter inch thread underneath it. Now I'll link the details to that in the show more information under this video so that you can go and get it. And I think it's a company called Ken Bromley in England that sell them. Now because this is a polycarb uh, surface, I can't put what they call a quarter 20 uh, T-nut assembly on this there's just nothing for it to bite into so what I've got is a very uh, simple metal I'm not quite sure what metal it is aluminium or zinc or something now I've got several of these that I've used on several setups in the past I simply put double-sided tape on this and I've got that and this is the same arrangement as my handheld but the ability to put this on a little tripod that I'm carrying with me is absolutely ideal and makes this not a second unit that I can use at some point, it actually makes it back as a primary unit and one that I carry in my little kit bag. So I'm really quite pleased at that. But the sun is now changing, the sky is clearing and I'm gonna see what the evening will bring us. So wish me luck. Okay, so I've got a large round from Rosemary. I have got one or two other brushes. That's my dagger. I love that little fella. What I'm looking for is a smaller round. That one, well, that's actually my rigger. I shall bring that one out. Actually, that can act as a small round if I want to. Okay, I don't know if I've got everything as I want it, but hopefully I can do what I want to do here without too many problems. Now. The sun is really coming down quite fast and I, you can almost see the sun here already sh making its presence felt. So I don't have an awful lot of time to do this. But what I want to do is just do a very quick little study in watercolour. And I just want to sort of, s we've got a lot of sky up here but it's not saying too much. Not like it was earlier. There's a lump of sky over there which is really quite good. So what I might do is just stick with that idea come through here with a fairly low horizon line. This, as I said, is hot pressed paper. It's ideal for all sorts of watercolor purposes. I love it best of all for its ink properties and what you can do with ink and wash, but uh, it works just as well for what I'm doing right now as well. Now we've got some hills coming down through here very shallowly. They sort of make their way down as they're going towards um, Sussex. Now if I kick the camera I do apologize I'm working in such a confined space and if I walk 
a couple of steps that way, I'm going to be paddling in a river. And I don't really want to do that. Um, so anyway, there we go. I'm just going to put in a few trees. There's lots of assorted trees, some breaking the horizon line through here, and they come all the way across. That's what you sort of lose the hills through here because they're disappearing behind all these trees. Now, what drew me to this point is there's this little farmhouse way back in here, just a little white building. It's very, very pale blue in this light, and there's a little roof on it and a couple of little chimneys. I'm just going to suggest it like that. I'm going to do more with it when it comes to the painting. But partly, this whole thing is just by to see if it works, to see if this apparatus works or if it just gives up under the pressure of drawing and sketching and all these other things. So hopefully we'll be okay, but you don't know until you're well into it. All right, so let's just carry on and a few trees this side. I know where it is and I can come back in there and refine that with the paint further in. So I think that's all the pencil work we need to do. So I'm going to put that down. We don't need it anymore. And I'm going to start looking at putting some water in place. I've got to be careful also. There are a lot of a plant called a giant hogweed. And not only is it not very good for one, I'm actually quite allergic to it. And uh, it really burned me a few years ago to the point where after 15 or 20 years or whenever it was, I still sometimes have to take tablets to combat the effects of it. That's how um, affected I was by it originally. Anyway, so I've got to be careful. So let's carry on. So I've got some water in place and hopefully the, stun, the sun will stay off this long enough to make it work. Now, I want to keep a lot of white paper through here for the water, the glistens, the little chinks of light that we can see in this. And I also want to put in quite a lovely wash to start with. So I'm going to come in here, just going to wet this down using the uh, dagger. I could use the large round probably just as easily. So I'm just going to come on here now and just wet this paper. Everything else that I put in, apart from really keeping this clean, doesn't really make a lot of odds because it's all going to be darker than the sky. Now the sky is an evening time, of course, and we've got some lovely blues, very pale blues, a little touch of blue in as much I'm going to put a little bit of cerulean blue, and that's going to be the top of my sky. It's very, very faint, as you can see. Not a lot of color going in there. But I just want a glint of it coming down, little suggestions of it in the paper like that. You can hardly see it, probably even on the film, to be fair. And as it comes down, I want to put in a little, oh, wrong paint. <laughs> Keep forgetting this is a dual purpose palette. Got some gouache as well as watercolor. And as this comes down now, I want a glint of this yellow throughout the sky. Very, 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 sorry, say that again. Very, very bright for an evening coming right the way down through here. It will turn increasingly warm as we draw closer to sunset. And that's a little bit of cadmium yellow, a little bit of Indian yellow as well, just to bring that down to the horizon line and the hills. I'm not gonna put any more in than that. I want this to dry so I can just tap in. I'm gonna use some of this violet color and that's going to form a few of my clouds that are coming through here. Just a little sense of them, maybe a bit bluer than that.
put in a little bit of so the cloud I was painting it's just completely disappeared on me I don't know where it's gone I don't know if it's burned off or if it's moved that way I, I wasn't watching um, but never mind let's kind of bring in a little bit of yellow accent to the base of this one like that paint that off and so that starts to form the suggestion that as it's deepening going down it's uh, marrying up with the yellows in these. Now I've really got to be patient and wait for that to dry. I don't want to get in here and do any of this mid-ground colour so what I'm going to do is I'm quite literally going to come in with the greens. Now, I've got a couple of greens working these days and that is a viridian and that will give me a cool darker green. I'm not quite sure I did mean to put in another colour. I didn't mean for that to happen that's for sure. Let's take that off before it spoils my picture completely bit clumsy. I think it's already done. That may well end up as a flock of birds again. <laughs> I got away with it. Never know. Hopefully I did. But that's always something to be aware of. But I am working into very, very strong light, almost where I need sunglasses just to look ahead of myself. But I think we're working so far. Now let's go back to our green colour. I'm not sure what that one is. No, it's not green. It's a thalo brew. I thought I had a uh, sap green in here, but I actually haven't made that uh, pigment available to me yet. So I'm going to come in with that. Not that. I keep getting in the wrong one. Can't see where I'm going. Now let's come mix in here. So we're going to come in with some viridian. Okay. Now we're looking at our field color, and I want it quite strong. Now when I say quite strong, I don't necessarily mean it's got to be thick paint. What I'm saying is I want quite a strong colour because it's going to dry paler but at the same time I don't want it to disappear and become too weak in terms of making this much brighter. Now I'm going to come in here and I'm going to run that through this field contour all the way through here. This is the top of the field. base colour for our field is now complete but what I would like to do I come in with some cadmium yellow very strong and cadmium yellow unlike Indian yellow or indeed aureolin is not transparent it's uh, a lot of opacity in that and because of that it will make its presence in these banks felt very very quickly like this coming in with that very sort of almost acidic colour green which is our riverbank through here and on the edge here and here, like that. And that's great. That's just what I was looking for. I want to make it all the way up through here too. So we've got a sense that we know that this is riverbank through there and through here. Irrespective of the darks that we're going to put in, it does suggest that we've got that riverbank. Now for the far distance, it's quite a cool colour. So I'm going to come in here with a little bit of sienna a little bit of raw sienna to our green color i've got to be careful because i can't put too much weight on this i just want to suggest we've got a little bit of color through there at the back there not a lot doesn't want too much hopefully that may just take the pressure off of that area what i'm tempted to do and i think i'm going to I'm just going to use a medium realm brush and then I'm going to take most of the water out of it. And now I'm going to run that along too wet and I'm going to cause myself an awful lot of problems with cauliflowers. I'm just going to run a little light way through there. Do it again. Nice thing about hot pressed paper, it can put up with quite a bit of punishment to be fair. All I was trying to do is cool down the back end of the field so that when we do come in with some stronger green colours, which I'm going to do very soon, I'm going to use a lot of viridian for this. And I'm going to come in with some more Indian yellow. So make quite a sap green colour. 
And I want to come back in here now and increase the dynamic on this field here. While it's still wet up the back there, that's great. Take it into that part of the field, down through here. Let the two areas merge, mold, and do what they want to do. And I think we can bring some of that, or a little bit of it, just suggesting a few dark patches into our riverbank. Now, they're not the total dark patches. We've got some stronger darks to get in there. I think that will just serve to suggest the angle of our riverbank. I'm going to leave that there, but what I want to do is I'm going to add in a little bit of Oriole. That's very, very dirty, so let's just get that out of there, clean that up, clean that colour. I do get a bit messy when I'm painting sometimes. I just want to suggest that very pale lemon color, very bright color into our water. And we're gonna start looking at the space beyond our hills, uh, sorry, beyond our fields and into our hills. Now the initial color is gonna be quite a pale violet color. I'm gonna use some, pick some of this up. It's gonna be a bit of green in there, but I want to put in, and I'm struggling now because that sun is just below my level of my um, boot lid as it were. I've got a rear boot lid and it serves me well whether it rains or whether it's sunny. But as the day is ending so that colour is getting more intense and hard to see without sort of squinting. Um, but there we are, it is what it is and we will carry on. Now very washy colour but it's going to be quite a dark colour I'm going to pay attention to what I need to do. So that's just too wishy-washy. Okay, so let's come in and remix. So come in with some stronger blue colour. This is cobalt blue. I'm going to tap in a little bit of ultramarine blue there. And to that, a little bit of alizarin. Okay, now let's take another look at that. As this colour goes towards the hills, it actually does weaken to a pale yellow colour. I'm going to run that all the way through as if there were no trees there at all where it would literally quite simply disappear off our page. Now there is a bit of shape to it, so let's just put that in place. So I'm gonna put a little bit of a rise in the hills there, and then they come down like so. There is information on them in terms that they are darker and lighter accordingly, but you don't see too much of that. What I will, however, do is put a little bit of aureole into that mix. I'm just going to bring that into the bottom area here so you sense that they get lighter as they hit the hills below them. Now assuming I've got this about dry, it should be fine. If it's too wet, it's going to push into the green and cause me all sorts of problems. But as you look at the hills, they're quite dark on top. Now that's caused by two things. Mainly it's because you're looking contra jour. You're looking into a massive amount of light ahead of me. And that does tend to silhouette the uh, object, i.e. the hills in this case. And as they come down to hit the terra firma, hit the ground as it were, in the foregrounds, then they get rise to light, atmospheric light. And so you get a sense of light along the, uh, the horizon, or my horizon light. You get a sense of light there. And so that's why it tends to lighten up and stay a little bit dark on top. But I now have to be patient and let that dry. While I'm doing that, I'm gonna use a small round brush and I'm just gonna pop in with a bit of a pale blue color. I'm gonna use the same color, a little bit more blue, just a tap more. Not too much, take the worst out of my brush and just want to paint the face of the shadow side of our house there. That's all I'm gonna do, and I've gotta be patient once again. Now everything by a little bit of time, a little bit of careful patience and things will work out fine. Now I think that this is drying off quite fast and I think it will allow me to come in and remix some greens. So I'm gonna come back in and me remix some, <laughs> not that color. Why do I keep going into that halo blue? I have a love-hate relationship with phthalo colors. They do tend to be very, very aggressive. I've actually given up with phthalo green now in favor of viridian, so that is a change to my palette. So I'm now looking at this green. That is way too 
uh, cool as a green. So where do I want to take this green now? I want a dark green, don't I? So I'm going to come in, mix some more of that in place. But I'm going to add in a little bit of red into that green. Not, not vermilion, uh, sorry, not um, alizarin, because alizarin is a cool red. And I don't want a cool red. The uh, vermilion is going to make it cool enough. But it makes a darker green without being so electric. If you put maybe orange into the green or something else like that, then your dark gets quite warm. And it's the wrong temperature of the day for that. So what I want to do is keep it quite cool. I'm having to look and squint now, so I've got to tilt down with my head. I just want to put in that bit of bank through here. Just checking where it's going, it goes across into here and closes off that bit of gap onto our river. even see what I'm popping my light my brush into to be fair okay hopefully that will be enough standing well back best I can I just want to put a little line of information through here out through there along to that area which is the far bank over there and I'm suggesting the dark areas of water reflecting bits of the bank and leaving the suggested lights from the sky in this water like that. So it's painting the negative space. And hopefully I'm getting away with it. Although to be fair, I can't quite see what I'm doing. So I may end up uh, not very happy with this painting at the end of the day, who knows? I hope not. It's hard to tell though, I'm just giving this a bit of strength through here. It has to be strong because it needs to sort of kick um, the butt of the sky, make it really pump as a light up in here. So this needs to be sort of about the right value through here with these darks and the shadows and the reflections of the reeds and the bank and all that other information. It sort of sets everything up and gives it a bit of weight to the whole painting. There, I'm gonna tap in a few little bits of suggested reedy bits in here. I'm gonna bring some of that down in here and there and sort of reverse that this way so that we suggest these reeds into the beginnings of our bank. Now, as I said earlier, these reeds are absolutely in the beginning of the annual life cycle. So you're not seeing too much height in them. sort of goes out and you can see the edge of that bank then this one goes through here and you can see a little bit of lights and darks popping all the way over and they're getting lower, smaller little taps of color as it goes round up through here and away from us and that little bit of dark which we're just going to pop in there and that suggests that little bit of river up the far back there that's all that was just a little touch of light just does everything you need it to do Okay, now here to make this interesting, I'm gonna put in um, tractor contours like that. One, very, very simple mark to make. Bring that one. Nice to be done with a dagger like that. And so you've got that lovely sense of the tractor tires. There are some further up I'm going to suggest that the tractor is come, has come across his field like that. Something like that. Hopefully that's enough and does the job. 
All right, so our foreground, our river, our fields are complete. All I've got to do now is, this is dry enough, I'm sure, to continue. So I'm gonna mix up some, uh, <laughs> I keep going into that halo blue again. I'm gonna take that off my palette. It's gotta come away, I think. So, <laughs> now that's the halo blue. I was right, actually. There we go, and I'm gonna bring some blue values into this. This grungy color that we were using down in here is gonna become paler because I'm putting more water to it, but I'm gonna put some more blues to it. And that gives me a darker blue. It's not a pure blue, it is a corrupted gray color, but it will give me enough to play around with the suggestion of trees and bushes up here. And that set against our distant hills will work beautifully, just enough. Could be even a little bluer. So let's come in with some cobalt into that. Very quick transition to a bluer color, take a lot of the paint out, I want it to be quite strong because too weak and it really won't work. So it's getting a little bit on the weak side. Come back with a little bit more of this color, that blue. There's some really prominent bushes. Now I guess that because of where we are on the marsh, many of these bushes, they may look as though they're forming boundaries to fields, when in fact what they are is their roadside. There's probably a road running off. Okay, just at that moment the camera battery ran out, so <laughs> hopefully I haven't missed too much, but uh, I'm, well, I think I was saying about the darkness on the color of these trees, and they border, mainly border the roads at that point. I'm going to put a little bit of darker green color into that. Just a little tap. There we go. They're very, very strong color for where they are, but they are very dominant in the picture, and I don't really want to lose that. Make them too pale and they will just become wishy-washy and they will have very little or no effect. Never too big, not the ones that border the rose because the local authority of course come along and flay them and keep them from sort of going over the entire road area, although many have done in the past. It's really quite attractive to see, but I think that sort of sets it up. What I'm a little worried about is here, a sort of one gap, one gap, one gap, and we are creatures of habit, so I'm gonna mix this up a little bit, break up some of this pattern, and so that it is not quite as I painted it to begin with. So that just breaks up that would-be pattern. Anyway, okay, now we've got a red roof here, but we can't see the red roof. It's quite a dark roof. That's all we're really seeing now. So let's just put that in very quickly like that, and just a couple of suggestions of windows through there. A little bit of a chimney on each end, which it has got. Don't see too much of what's happening there, but there is a lot of trees that are surrounding it. Now I've got a lot of dry brush, and I'm using the dagger for this too, because using a dry brush really does aid you to break up some of the forms on these more open form trees that we've got at this distance. They're not fully leafed up, they are becoming so, but they are still there, and you can see lots of gaps, lots of what I call sky holes through them. So just coming through there like that. Now they stop maybe about here. I think I've got a few draw marks, one and one up there. The dryness in the brush is just allowing it to skip over some of the surface. Now you're not gonna get too much of a skipping, not like using, um, rough paper, that's not gonna happen. This is hot press and it's quite a smooth surface. But when the brush becomes quite dry, then you do get a, quite a bit of this sort of missing because the paint is just not powerful enough with the water to cover every little part of the surface of your paper. dark here and there. Not too much, can't see too much detail, so don't go too mad with this. There we are. I think we're almost done. Quite like what we've got. Maybe a few reinforced darks up through there and this one, there and there, and then you, with the darks here you see, 
what's happening is you can leave little bits of light, which is the top of that field, but every so often you see a little bit of that hill going through the back end. And that tells you that it carries on past this lot and down into nothing. What I do, of course, want to do is put a few little crows returning to their roosts at the end of the day, going across the scene. They don't fly normally in level flight, so they're all over the place, but it just gives rise to a little bit of life, a little bit of something more than just trees, field, and the sky. You've got a lovely sense of birds that are just coming home to roost for the end of the day. I think we've got a lovely picture. So I'm going to leave it there before I do something I regret, and that's easily done. All right, so let's just put in a signature, call this painting complete. Okay, everybody, it's signed, it's finished. I'm really happy with the outcome, especially as I can't even see in front of me anymore, not properly anyway. Everything is becoming very intense to look at, and I think I just about got away with this one. Now, I do hope you've enjoyed it, and I do hope that you've got something from it. I really do. And I will, as I pack away, I will just turn this over upside down so you can see that thread arrangement for the tripod mount that I mentioned earlier from Ken Bromley. It's not as cheap as using a um, one of these T-nuts or a uh, what do they call it, a 20 quarter 20 or something. Um, it's not as cheap as using one of those, but it is more permanent. It spreads the weight and it works very, very well. And I have never <laughs> touch wood. I have never had one fail on me or come away, but this has just been put on with double-sided tape. Anyway, I'll show you that in a minute. I'm going to pack up, I'm going to head home, check the footage, and rest my eyes and catch each and every one of you in a video very, very soon. I hope you enjoy this one. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Okay, so what I was talking about earlier, this was the frame that was attached to this component here. Now this was, as I said earlier, or in the last video, was the first version of what I actually made to be a handheld. And it's quite heavy. And the magnets, okay, these ones have stayed on, to be fair. But the first ones that I did were not, and it was a little bit too much. So what I did, I in the last video, as I said, I wasn't sure what to do with this or just leave it as a spare. But what I did do is I actually put on a metal plate. Now this plate has a quarter inch thread in it and I simply double sided tape this to this surface here and I put in the mount for the tripod. This just clips in place. It's a little uh, thicker and heavier because of that but it has given this much more purpose uh, for the future, and I'm really happy with the outcome. So that's just a little update for you on this spare piece of kit that I first made as my version 1 of my handheld. It's now version 1 on my mini tripod easel. There you go. Catch you later.